So I'm remodeling the guest bedroom in my house after six years because it was the only room in the house that I never really got to working on because I was living in here through the main remodel that we did. And we're going to put some window trim on these windows here. We're going to put a piece of stool in here. I'm going to put actually stool and apron on the bottom of this window and then the casing and then that classical head or an entablature up at the top. So here's the difference between a stool and a sill. The stool is the trim that attaches to the bottom of the roof opening and butts into the sill. This is the window sill. It's part of the actual jam around the window. And so the decorative stool is going to come in and I'm going to have to cut it. I'm going to have to scribe it so it fits the wall and fits tight up against the sill all the way across the window. So that's what I'm setting up to do. Let's look at this rough opening because it is a rough opening. You got to prepare the opening for the scribe that you're going to do. The first thing I do is I install a cleat. I just screw the cleat right to the wall. And that way when I scribe this piece in, the stool, I can clamp the stool to this cleat, run my scribes, and that way the stool will never move, not even a little tiny bit until I'm finished scribing. The other thing I've done is I've put these drywall screws in, four of them along the rough sill, and I put those in so that I could adjust the height of where the finished stool is going to sit. Now this is a little bit premature, I could have waited and done this later, but I like to do all the prep work right from the get-go. The screws are kind of cool, they're like shims. You can drive them in and adjust the height of the finished stool. I want the stool, and this is just a scrap of it, so it's exactly the same thickness. I want the finished stool to leave a reveal on the edge of the sill here of about an eighth of an inch. The reveal is just the exposure of the sill above the stool, and it's really easy to adjust these screws. I can, if I drive them in a little bit like that, I'll be increasing the reveal, and if I pull them back out just a little, I'll be decreasing it. And it looks like I'm a little high there, so I'm going to run this screw in just a hair. There we go. That's just right, about an eighth of an inch. Sometimes you're going to want to use a screwdriver to just hand tighten or hand loosen those drywall screws just a little bit to adjust them perfectly. So now that I've got the opening prepared, I'm going to bring in the stool and you'll notice I've got a pencil line dead center on the stool and another mark dead center on the center of this mull, which is the center of the window. That way, once I scribe this, the stool is going to be even. It's going to, have, it's going to project the same distance past the casing on that side that it projects past the casing on this side. Now I can clamp this tight. It's dead centered on the opening on the window. It won't move at all while I'm scribing, so when I'm finished and I cut this, it'll fit perfectly, hopefully, the first time. But before we can scribe it, this edge of the stool has to be perfectly parallel with the window. So I'm going to measure from the jam to the stool here, and I've got two inches. And down at this end, oh, look at that. I've got an inch and seven eighths. Well, I'm going to have to shim this end away from the wall about an eighth of an inch to keep this edge parallel with the sill before I pull out my scribes. So I'm going to put a shim underneath this end of the stool about an eighth of an inch and measure that and look at that. So now we've got the stool set up so it's perfectly parallel to the sill, maybe. So let's check it right in the middle of the span where the mull is. Oh, and look at that, inch and seven eighths. How could that be? I mean, we had it two inches here and we had it two inches down here. How could it be an inch and seven eighths here? I'll tell you how it happened. When the window was installed, the nailing flange was fastened off to the wall all the way around the outside. And when it was nailed tight against the sill down here, this area of the window, the mull, the back-to-back -back mull, got pushed in just a little bit so the actual window isn't in a perfectly straight line. I'm going to end up having to scribe this whole edge, too, to fit the window. But the first step is to scribe the two horns. So I'm going to set my scribes up for two inches right there. Then to check it, I'm going to hold my scribes against the jam and slide it down 
until it just touches the stool. And oh, look, it's missing the stool. So I'm going to spread it open just a little bit and check it again, keeping it parallel, perfectly parallel to the jam and perpendicular to the jam. There we go. It's just touching the back of the stool. So I don't have a lot that I have to be careful about here, just the very end until this drywall ends. But if the drywall were all the way to here, I'd be careful about scribing the whole thing. But remember, the casing is going to cover almost this whole area. All that's going to be exposed is the very back edge of the stool. But I also want a shoulder cut. And I want it just clear of the trimmer and the drywall. So there's my shoulder cut. And while I'm here, I can take this scribe line and I can continue it right to the shoulder. And I'll cut this out with my jigsaw. But first, I gotta scribe the other horn. So I'll scribe this horn too. You can see it's not quite a straight line. It never is. And I'm gonna also mark this shoulder cut right about there. And I can continue that line from the scribe line right to the shoulder cut. And this is the piece I'm going to take out. I like to use a barrel grip jigsaw to make these kinds of cuts from the top, but I also laminated a piece of quarter inch plywood onto the bottom of my base here, bottom of the saw base, so I have a flatter surface to rest on my workpiece and a slightly larger one too. And I can see exactly where I need to place it to make my cut. But I have to plug the cord in. Mall is proud of the windowsill, so I'm gonna have to cut off just a little bit of it. So I'm gonna drop my square and leave a nice about an eighth inch reveal on the jam and score a line right across that mall. Let's we'll see how this fits. I gotta set it on top of the screws, and then I have to press it down so it'll clear that piece of mall cap that I trimmed off. Oh, and look at that. It's almost tight to the wall, but it's rocking. Look at that, it's rocking on the sill because that sill, like I said, it's got a little bit of a bow in it. So I've got to scribe that off next. I've got two sets of scribes here. This is the one I like to use most often. It's got an old cross lead pencil and it's a nine millimeter lead in there so it doesn't break off very easily. But you'll notice I've got that one set up so that the tips are almost flush right here. Whereas this Pentel pencil, which is also nine millimeter, I've got it set up so it's just a little bit back from the point on the scribe. This point on the scribe is proud of the pencil. And that's so I can take that scribe and get the point down against the sill and still be able to run a line across the top of the stool just like that. So the line daylights out right there and look, I can get in everywhere, even underneath this handle with my scribes. And then the line gets deeper on the stool through here. And along here too, pretty deep. And then it daylights out about the same place right back here. All because of the bow in that window. Great. Now all you have to do is cut that line off and all both these ends then will come up tight against the drywall. For this kind of scribe, I much prefer to use a little 
power planer. Now this one's electric. You can get these cordless now. I don't have one, but this thing works just fine for me. And to make this cut, all you have to do is establish a, you know, a, a depth of cut to start with. And then to control the depth of cut, all you do as you're riding the, the plane along the workpiece, just tip it up or tip it back. And that's how you can control whether you're cutting deeper, closer to the line, or shallower by tipping it out away from the line. Let me show you what I mean. Right here, I'm cut the deepest, so I keep the plane kind of straight. And now, I'm going to tip the plane out as I come to zero. You can see, right where I was cutting the deepest, I had the plane straight, and then as I start coming out of it, I tip the plane back and back and back further and further until I'm coming out to zero. Now I want to back bevel the whole thing so the very top edge kisses up tight to the sill on the window. So before I finish, I will have back beveled even the places where I don't need the plane off much at all. All right, let's go see how it fits. Push it down underneath that wall cap, right on top of the screws. Ooh, look at that. It's tight up against the sill all the way, just as it comes tight against the drywall too. Perfect. So that's the hard part, really. And now that it's done, we can set up for the easy part. First thing I wanna do is, I wanna mark what the, ID of the jam is. It's right there. And I want to put a mark about an eighth of an inch back from there for the reveal of my jam extension. And that tells me that my jam extension sits right there. And the same on this end. I'm going to take my square, I'm going to mark the ID of the jam right there. I'm going to measure in from there an eighth of an inch for my reveal. You can go three sixteenths and put an X on that side of the line. There's only a couple of measurements I need before I go up to my shop. I need to know what the ID of the head is. It's 46 and a half. And I need to add an eighth and an eighth to that for reveals on the jam. That's 46 and three quarters. And I'll write that down right here. And then all I need are two more measurements and they should be the same. I want to measure the height of the jam extension is 30 and a half inches to the ID of the jam, to the inside of the jam. I'm going to add three quarters of an inch to that for the thickness of the head jam. And I'm going to add another eighth of an inch for reveal. So that would make it 31 and three eighths. I'll write that number down right here. And the same over here should be 30 and a half the I, yep, dead on. So both of these are the same, 31 and 3 eighths. And the last thing I've got to do is figure out how wide the jam extensions are. Well, this one's easy at the bottom. I just have to measure the notch in the stool. But at the top, I need to take my square and cross the drywall and measure right here and see how far out I got to come to that square. It's two and a quarter. And on this side, Yeah, it's two and a quarter over here too. So I got to cut tapered jam extensions. They're going to go from two inches at the bottom. Remember that was the scribe we measured from two inches at the bottom to two and a quarter inches at the top. Now that I've got all my notes on the sill, I can take this up to my shop. I can cut the jam extension legs and the head and assemble the whole thing in my shop and bring it down here in one piece and hope that it fits. So I taper cut the jam extension legs. They're two and a quarter at the top to two inches at the bottom. And if you remember, I made an index mark on the stool flush with the ID of the jam on the window. And I made another mark for the back set for the reveal. So all I have to do is take this jam extension, hold it right at that back set mark, and I'm gonna tack it with this 21 gauge nailer.
take this thing down to that window and check it and make sure it fits before I cut the casing for the sides, the two legs, and the head for the top. The moment of truth, just put it on top of those screws. I have to push it down to get underneath this mole that I already cut. And this mole I still have to cut, but I'm gonna center it. And I've got my eighth inch reveal here and my eighth inch reveal across the bottom of the sill and a nice eighth inch reveal right here going all the way up and an eighth inch reveal across the top too. It's just perfect. All I have to do is trim off the top of this mole right there. This is a really cool handmade back saw made by Glenn Drake. I bought it years ago and I just love it. It's meant for cutting dovetails, which I have rarely done, <laughs> but I do use it all the time for any kind of cuts that really have to be just dead on because the end of the saw has no teeth in it. The teeth don't begin until here, which is really cool. You can take it and you can slide it across a piece of wood to get it started and the teeth won't start biting until right there, which is really nice because by sliding it, you can slide it right on your pencil line and keep it right on your line before you start cutting. So first I'll take my square and my utility knife and score a line pretty deep. go. Now that that mole's cut on the top, I can put this thing back in here one more time. Get the bottom in. There's the top. Awesome. All I got to do is fasten it to the jam and that I'm going to do with trim head screws. So I'm drilling an eighth inch hole way back from the reveal line. I'm just going to hold this jam extension exactly where I want it on the jam. That's it. Now when I put the casing on, it'll definitely cover that screw. And I'll go ahead and fasten off the whole frame just like that. So I'm just going to shoot 18 gauge brads into the stool because it's perfectly level and exactly the right elevation. And the jam extensions that are screwed to the existing jam are going to hold that sill tight. And once I get to it a little bit later, when I finish putting on the trim, I'll put the apron on underneath it and that'll help support the stool too. When I cut mitered casing, I like to install the head first. That's the way I was taught and for one good reason, it works. Because the head casing determines the jam reveal on both sides of the frame, it's a lot easier to install the head first. If you nail on the legs first and the head's cut a little short or a little long, well, then you have to make adjustments. But for classical heads, I like to nail the legs on first because then they can support the head. And I usually, not in this case, but usually, I use biscuits or dominoes in that joint. Try doing that if you install the head first. At the risk of boring a lot of you, I think it might help some folks if I run through the steps for measuring and creating a casing cut list. The casing legs are easy. The distance from the top of the stool to the inside of the jam extension is 30 and 5 eighths of an inch. When I install jam extensions with an eighth inch reveal, I like to use a 3 16 reveal for the casing rather than a quarter inch. I know it's a little like splitting hairs, but I think the smaller, more traditional reveal looks better. So that would make the length of the casing legs 30 and 13 sixteenths. The head casing or the entablature is also pretty simple to measure. The ID or inside of the extension jams measures 46 and three quarters. That's the same dimension as the length of the head jam extension. I add three sixteenths of an inch twice to that length for the reveal on both sides of the head casing. And I also add the width of the casing twice once for each side. In this case, I ripped the casing to 3 and 11 sixteenths, so the overall length of the head or entablature is 54 and a half inches. That makes the end of the entablature, the frieze, flush with the casing. Now, some carpenters might add another half inch to that measurement so that the entablature is a quarter inch proud of the casing on each side, and some carpenters might add even more but look at any illustration of the classical orders and you'll notice that the entablature is always flush with the column supporting it, 
not the capital, but the column. Casing represents a classical column, so it should also be flush with the end of the entablature. So we got our cut list, and I like to cut the head first because that's a known number, and we want the head to be flush with the OD of the casing, like we said before, and that's 54 and a half. I know a lot of you don't have a saw gear like this. 54 inches and one half, and sometimes, you know, it's a lot easier just to pull out your tape measure, but since I got it, I'm gonna square this end up. And that's the head. So I'm not gonna self-return these ends. This is paint grade. I'm just gonna sand the end grain real good. And even on stain grade work, sometimes I like to, to leave the end grain exposed and not self-return the headpiece because you see that end grain, if you sand it real good, it kind of looks cool and through the paint, looks really nice through the stain. So this gives us the length of the other two pieces we have to cut. If this is 54 and a half, then the little architrave bead, that some people call a parting bead, but on a head, it's really the architrave bead, that's gotta be about a quarter of an inch longer at each end, so that's 55, and the same with the crown on the top. But the crown on the top, we're gonna measure that in a special way. You'll see what I mean. Now all I gotta do is cut the legs, and they are 30 inches and 13 sixteenths. Here comes that stop. Now when I cut stuff up against the stop, I like to hold my hand on the piece that's touching the stop. If I had a longer piece in here and it stuck out this far, I'd be tempted to hold it here. But if you do that, as you pull your saw out of the piece that's against the stop, it can tweak that piece and it won't be cut perfectly square. So I'm gonna make sure. Hold that still in the saw. And here's the second one. Some people call this a parting bead, but it's really an architrave bead because it's the bottom element on an entablature. First, I'll square this up. I need, I need that little self return cap, and I always do the same thing. I pretend like everything's stain great. I like to see the grain run in the right direction. So the first thing I'll do is cut the little self return cap so I can take all the pieces off in the direction of the grain. That's the cap, and now I need the long point. Swing the saw in the opposite direction. Now I can pull my measurement. Now that measured 54 and a half. That was the measurement of the freeze. And I want to add a quarter of an inch to each side for this architrave bead. So that would make it 55 inches. Long point to long point. 55 right here. So now I'll swing my saw back in the opposite direction. So here's my measurement mark. And I'm gonna exaggerate this because this method is really important if you wanna be able to cut precisely. I'm gonna cut way wide of that mark. And now I'm gonna slowly creep that measurement mark right up toward the blade using just my thumb. My knuckle on my left hand is not gonna move from the fence. I'm gonna use that knuckle position right here to hold my hand rigid so it doesn't move at all. Just my thumb moves. See, I'm, I'm slowly bringing it this way. So I'm exaggerating this so you can see how you can creep up right on that measurement mark. And there's the piece. You can cut right to the center of the graphite line. Now all I need is a self-return cap, and this got frayed. So I'm gonna pull that off from a little bit further over here. That's it. I'll 
I'll put these two together, and I'll put these three together in just a minute, but before I do that, I want to cut that crown that goes on the top. Let's look at this closely. This would be the freeze, and here's the fillet on the bottom of the crown. I've got the crown upside down. The crown actually projects past the freeze, the fillet projects past the freeze, three-eighths of an inch. It's a lot different than the architrave bead. The architrave bead projected only a quarter. But I want this 3 8 inch projection right here to be exactly the same. So if this piece were to freeze, I'd want that piece of crown to extend 3 8 of an inch past on the fillet. That means I've got to add 3 8 of an inch to each side, that's 3 quarters of an inch, to the 54 and a half inch measurement. So this crown has to be measured to 55 and a quarter, which is different than the little architrave bead. So let's get started on that because the way you measure this is tricky too. Just like with the architrave bead, I'm gonna cut the little self-return caps first. First, I'm gonna square this up. Swing to 90, swing to a 45. Swing the saw in the opposite direction. And I'm ready to make my measurement. Here's the mistake a lot of people make. You get in this habit of measuring the architrave bead and you hook your tape right on the long point there, and that's not where the measurement registers. When you measure this piece, you don't hook your tape on this long point. You hook your tape on this long point. So I'm gonna take my tape measure, I'm gonna hook it on that long point right there at the top of the fillet, and I'm gonna pull my measurement mark to 55 and a quarter inches. And when I cut my miter here, I'm gonna make sure that my blade passes right through that pencil line. Same game. I need the little cap now, the self-return cap. And some of you are noticing I'm not letting my saw blade stop now before I lift the blade up out of the wood. That's because this material is so much bigger. It has enough weight that the wind on the blade isn't going to draw it into the teeth. Whereas that little architrave bead, boy, those little pieces, you've got to wait for the blade to stop dead before you try and lift the blade up. I've got my piece and I got the two self-return caps and if it was stain grade, the grain of that wood would run right on around those caps as well. And I like doing it that way, not just for stain grade stuff, but if you're getting your molding from who knows where, if it isn't Windsor One like this, it might not be precise from one piece to the next and your caps might not line up, the profiles might not line up. So it's safest to get your caps as close as you can out of the piece of stock to where you cut your miter. I'm going to use 2P10 to put these little self-returns together, but not too much of it. And then I'll spray the little cap so I can keep my fingers away from it, especially now that I've got glue all over my fingers. Set this down and then hinge that closed like so. And the excess is okay. I don't have to worry about it. I can cut that off with a putty knife in just a minute. I'll do the same thing at this end. There we go. For this crown cap, I like to use yellow glue for a couple of reasons. Number one, that little architrave bead is so small, it's kind of hard to shoot a nail through it without having the nail come right through the piece into your finger. But the real reason is because on this little crown return, I like to make sure I have time to align it. See what I mean? I've got to slide that around to get it just right. So I'm going to put a little spring clamp on it just to draw that together. 
and then I'll pin it with a 23 gauge pin nail. Same on this side. I like to leave those clamps on as long as I can because it's the clamps that are really pressure fitting that joint. And like we've all learned the hard way, if you just push your joints together and you don't put a clamp on them and really put them under pressure, you're not going to get a very good glue joint out of it. And there we go. Put a spring clamp on that one too. Just a little bit of pressure but enough to squeeze that joint. You can see the squeeze out coming right out of there. Now I've got to align this, and that's, that's exactly why I don't like using that cyanoacrylic glue on this crown profile. There we go. And we'll leave those clamps on there until that glue sets a little bit. First, I'm gonna run a bead of glue right across the top of the freeze. And then I'm going to take the fillet and set it right on top of that and flush it up to the back of the freeze. Put my fingers on both ends. This is the, um, this isn't like eyeball and install. This is kind of feel and install. I'm going to feel the projection on both ends and even it out. And then, this is pretty simple, I'll just put a clamp right here. When you put this clamp on with that glue in there, it acts a little bit like a lubricant and it'll slide this around a hair. So you want to correct for that and make sure it's flush. Then I'm going to drill, drill a through hole here. That's not a pilot hole. It's a through hole. I want the screw to drop right through it. I don't want the screw to bite into that cap at all. There we go. And while I'm here, I'll put a second one in. I'm just going to spin it around so I can hang it off the end again. Get that clamp back on it. Make sure it's flush to the back of the freeze. we go. And one more hole. Now if this was a two-story with a balcony above or something, I wouldn't be able to use these exposed screws. But I still wouldn't want to use nails because if you shoot a nail through this top cap, it could come out anywhere. It could bend and come out the back, but worse, it could come right out the face of the freeze, which would ruin the whole thing. So I'd probably put it together with trim head screws. There. So this is what we've got so far. We've got the freeze with the cap on it. First thing I'll do is I'll just run a little bead of glue down here. set this into the glue with that about quarter inch of overhang and then this piece I'm just going to tack that with a 23 gauge brad and push it just a hair till it's centered that's those 23 gauge little brads are so handy just keeping it flush to the back of the freeze. And I'll put a little nail through each one of these little return caps too. Now all I need to do is get a wet rag and wipe off this excess glue. This thing will be ready to install down on that window. Now all I've got left to do is cut the apron, and the apron stain grade. So I want to be careful when I cut these little self-return caps. This is what I was talking about earlier. I like to see the grain run right around the cap. So I'm going to first start with this thing square. 
I'm just stopping the blade with a long piece. And then I'm gonna cut that little cap. So I'm gonna swing the saw and cut a little 45 on here. And I'm gonna use the laser this time and line the laser up with the back edge of that molding. See how that piece falls down right there? You gotta be careful. Don't lift the blade too soon or you'll suck that piece right into the blade. Now I'm gonna swing the saw in the opposite direction. Because this is an outside corner measurement. I gotta hook my tape on the long point right here. And that, because this is inverted, this is a piece of baseboard, a three-step base, but it's inverted. The, this bottom section of it is actually the top that's going to kiss up against the bottom of the stool. So I want to measure from that point because it's the furthest projection of the long point. And that measures 56 inches right to here. And that measurement's on the face of the molding, not the back. This isn't like baseboard because I want that miter, that long point of that miter, to come right out at that mark. I just need the self-return cap for this one. So I'll swing the saw. And relieve that piece. Just release it by cutting 90 degrees to the short point right there. And I think you've seen me put together enough self-return little caps already with the glue and the little pin nails and the spring clamps. I'm going to do the same thing with these. I'm not going to use 2P10 to put this together because I'm going to want to wiggle these around and get them just right. And then I'll fire a couple 23 gauge pins in them. I'm going to nail the casing on with a 21 gauge gun. The 23 is too small. The 18 is a little big. I'll probably use that on the head. But this way I won't leave any big holes in the casing. Oops, I had a little shiner here. That dug fur, boy, can drag a nail in all kinds of directions. But it's nice about these little nails is you can bend it back and forth. It'll pop off and it's below the surface of the wood. So now with both casing legs on and cut exactly the right height, all I have to do is set the head on top of those legs. And that should position everything. Let me make sure this is plumb. This should be a plumb line straight down. Right there should do it. And that one's perfectly straight. So all I gotta do is nail this thing off. Since I haven't put the apron on yet, yeah, don't put the apron on until after you've fastened the stool to the bottom of the casing. Now I can fire some nails right up through the stool this way. The casing legs are tied to the stool really well and nothing will ever move. Now I can put the apron on. So here we are with the apron and some of you are going to think this is the same piece that I cut up in my shop, but um, it's not. <laughs> I cut it twice. The first time I cut it and I did it in my shop, I measured all the way to the outside of the stool, to the outside of the stool, and that's wrong. The apron should end at the outside of the casing. You should measure OD a casing to OD a casing, and I'll show you why. So the stool would be like the top of a pedestal. And this would be the trim, or like the chair rail, going around the pedestal and around the column. There's a plumb line from the outside of the stool to the casing to the head. And this follows classical details in the classical orders. And all I have to do is tack this on. Get my nails lined up so they're plumb. 